thank you all for joining us at this very special time at 10 a.m. We're usually in the afternoon, so we're uh, we're going to do some kiss and eggs this morning. And we are very excited to have Matt Stoller with us from the American Economic Liberties Project. So Matt is the publisher of the big newsletter and author of the book, Goliath. So today we're going to have a, a wide ranging conversation on monopolies and antitrust in today's environment. Um, the discussion is meant to be entertaining. It's meant to be educational. It's not meant to be taken as investment advice. Um, we have a Q&A button, as always, down at the bottom of the screen. We'll try and incorporate your questions into the discussion. But um, with us, of course, as always, Michael Green and Harley Bassman. So uh, guys, take it off. Oh, thank you very much, Brian and Matt. It's great to have you here, Harley. I'll deal with you later. The uh, No, I'm teasing here. We're always thrilled to have Harley. All right. So one of the things that has been a real blast for me over the past couple of years has been getting to know Matt and getting to know his theory and his work behind the dynamics of antitrust. Um, this is probably one of the most loaded topics in finance today, this issue of are we just seeing fantastic companies and should governments just get out of the way? Or are we seeing evidence of anti-competitive and monopolistic behavior that in turn may have costs alongside it that we're not fully appreciating or aware of? And also, are those monopolies being reinforced in kind of a positive feedback loop in the ways that I often describe, talking about the influence of passive investing and how that's raising the market caps and lowering the cost of capital for many large companies. Uh, Matt, maybe you could just give us just some very quick background. How the heck did you get so involved in this area? What, what drew you into becoming effectively part of a revolutionary vanguard that's really pushing back against a very fundamental shift that happened over our investment lives, you know, really the realization of the Bork Doctrine and consolidation in a way we just haven't seen before. What pulled you in on the other side? Well, the short answer is too big to fail banks. Okay. That was, I was a staffer in Congress during the financial crisis. And so I was, um, and I worked on dealing with, uh, you know, foreclosures and some stuff on the Federal Reserve. Uh, and I helped work on Dodd-Frank. You're welcome. We fixed it all. Uh, everything's <laughs> great. Um, and when you see, you know, I was Democrat, but I'm like, why did we choose to foreclose on everyone? That's not the party of the people kind of thing. And I tried to figure out, well, what happened? Like, what? Well, why did we make those choices? And it led me to studying history and realized, oh, there's this whole dormant tradition. There's a whole anti-monopoly dormant tradition that we really forgot about. So I wrote a book on that. And then that actually led to thinking about consolidation across much of the economy. Um, big tech would be the pace setters, the magnificent seven, I guess, or eight or whatever, however many, you, you guys always have a new term. Um, but but uh, the persistent, um, persistent high profit levels of our most dominant firms, our firms are older uh, and bigger than they've ever been. Uh, the less turnover, less business formation, although that's that's changed in few in recent years. These kinds of things you kind of notice, and then you realize, oh, it's it has to do with a bunch of policy levers that we we changed in the '80s and continue to to change in the '90s and 2000s. So this is one of the things that always jumps out at me, and it's this this underlying issue of we presume that what we're watching is always the free market at work. But there is no real, there's really no such thing as the free market, right? We establish rules around the behaviors and then we choose to enforce them or not. I like to describe it as less of a free market and more of an aquarium, right? You're trying to actually create a closest possible simulation of something that looks like the outside with characteristics emphasized in a way that you want. Do you want pretty bright fish? Well, then you don't put sharks in your tank, for example, right? But you're highlighting effectively that the way we interpreted rules change in a very substantive way about 40 years ago right? and has led to a very different place than we might have otherwise been. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, the, the you know, your initial question is, are, are our companies great or are they, um, you know, functional market power? And I think the 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 answer is, is uh, at first they're great and then and then yep. not. Right. And. In a lot of ways, the economy we're living in is a little bit illusory. Um, and I think the best example of this is Boeing, because Boeing in the 1990s was perceived of as the, the national champion. They had they were the sort of the winner of a consolidation wave in defense and aerospace. And the perception was we have to strengthen Boeing 
And Boeing is this great company that makes amazing airplanes. And why wouldn't we want them to control the aerospace industry? Um, you fast forward to 2018, first year that they hit $100 billion of revenue. They could do no wrong. But internally, the operational capacity was collapsing. Mm -hmm. And nobody realized that from the kind of investor standpoint, because monopolies look really good until they don't. And then the 737 MAX happens. Um, and it becomes obvious that you kind of like what they had done over the last uh, 20 years because of a lack of competition and then specific choices on how to organize the firm, the kind of Jack Welch model ended up destroying the enterprise value of Boeing. And I think you see that across a lot of the companies that we think of as really great. So what you'll hear today from people at, say, Google or uh, Amazon is that it's a very different company than it was 10 years ago. It used to be really experimental and fun and a place you could do cool things and make cool things. And now it's very bureaucratic. It's a lot like big government. And that's a function of a lack of competition. And that's what we have kind of across the economy in our top firms. It's extraordinarily dangerous situation. And right now, I think we're kind of at the, the 2018 Boeing moment where it looks like everything's great. And then it turns out that, you know, you kick over a rock and cockroaches go everywhere. So I, I think that's a great analogy. And um, it highlights, you know, it, it does a couple of things. One, um, it highlights this underlying issue of what is a monopoly, right? So most Americans, their exposure to monopoly is basically at six years old, their parents pull out this overly confusing and, and uh, complex game that if they play it over and over again, they'll eventually figure out the rules associated with things like monopoly. Make your sister cry. You'll make your sister cry at some point in the process, right? right. Um, or your parents will make you cry and you'll figure out how to fight back against them in a variety you, of ways. Do you, do you, Michael, do you need a hug? What, what kind of <laughs> exactly. Here we go. Yes. Thank you, Matt. Are you all right? I'm are feeling you, fine. Okay. So Harley, I, do you want to intervene here? I feel like... <laughs> Oh wow, I, I, Harley, did you bring this guest or did I bring this guest here? This is a hard <laughs> crowd here. All right. So I, I want to share a couple of slides that, that hit on these issues. And um, as Olga, my, uh, my, my, my favorite member within the Simplified team, likes to point out, I'm going to go off the reservation for two seconds because I forgot to put something in. But I do want people to actually see a couple of uh, slides. So one is this issue of does size actually matter? Or are we actually empirically seeing the data that Matt's talking about? And there's actually a growing body of literature that's highlighting that indeed we've actually seen fairly significant increases in concentration. Um, Grion wrote on this in 2017. And actually I'm going to go, as I said, off the reservation, share one slide. Olga, I apologize. This is straight from the same paper for the source for those who are paying attention. But this is what's called the herfindahl hirschman Index. This is trends in industry consolidation. And part of what's really important to understand is, is that the levels of consolidation that we're experiencing are actually higher than the levels of consolidation that we had prior to the deregulation wave in the early 1980s, right? So we've actually taken a pattern that had become largely shrinking companies, more companies listed, et cetera, now we've consolidated them fairly significantly. We're running somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 percent above the levels of concentration that we had 50 years ago. Matt, is there anything I said there other than uh, the, the Olga part that you want to uh, add to? Well, the chart ends in 2014. And, and exactly. You yep. probably see it go up a little bit more. Yep. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's right. I think that's right. So the data I'm just using is the 2017 data there to just show that. But the underlying characteristic that we're talking about, we've seen this increase in consolidation. We know this wave has occurred. Um, the second thing I think that's actually really interesting is how the story has shifted. And so to go back to this, and this is actually um, obviously a former employer of mine, um, somebody who I think of exceptionally highly, but I love the fact that in 2012, he's being interviewed by CNN and he's positing that Google has all this cash and has no idea what to do with it. And then 2014, the book Zero to One is written that effectively is a love story for monopolies, right? You know, we look at a company like Google and all that innovation supposedly requires relying on these very large companies. And to me, this is part of the narrative that has really shifted. We've gone from saying, Big companies are not innovative. Big companies are not interesting. Big companies have too much cash and don't know what to do to them. 
to this idea that big companies somehow or other deserve to be the biggest companies by virtue of being the best. And their large cash hoards are um, impenetrable fortresses that are useful for investors. Matt, with, you know, as, as somebody sitting outside the industry, how would you kind of fight back or how would you argue that this isn't actually true, that we're creating surplus and flexibility that allows an increase in innovation to occur? Things like ChatGPT, for example, you know, remaining or emerging inside businesses like Google. Well, I mean, the best examples would be, uh, I mean, I could go back to Boeing and Intel, yep. right, which would, like monopolies look, look I mean, monopolies spend a lot on PR. So they're going to look really good. They <laughs> tell a great story uh, and they're going to look really good until they don't. And, um, you know, I think you saw that with Facebook, right? Facebook, uh, it, you know, it's a it's very high, like a trillion dollar company, right? But like um, it was that they... they they strangled uh, Twitter's vine, right? And now TikTok came in. And what what came out in one of the antitrust cases against Facebook, the Facebook uh, meta within trial, mm -hmm. is that a lot of the problem with uh, their development of virtual reality is that they're not very good at developing products. And one of the people there who's sort of the, um, or, or like one of the legendary guys who created virtual reality, I think he started the, he, he helped create the video game Doom, which was, you know, um, a step change in the yeah. in the video game industry. Uh, he worked at Meta, and then the next week he resigned, and he testified in the trial. He said they can't make any decisions; it's too big. And yeah. um, so, so I think what you see is like it's true that there's a lot of um, capital and talent and and in these companies, and they actually do create a lot of stuff. But that stuff doesn't always get out of uh, of the uh, of the borders of the company. And that I think is a big problem. So, so Google was one of the original creators of, of machine learning and AI, but it wasn't Google that commercialized any of it. It was a small company, open AI, um, and, and Microsoft and, you know, a lot of these companies had, they were working hard on this technology, but they're just so big that they couldn't deploy it. And that's consistent with the history here. I mean, you can look at Western uh, union, which was, you know, the telegraph monopoly and they, um, Alexander Graham Bell actually went to them with their, with his telephone and the CEO of, uh, or the president of, of Western union said, what, what would I do with this electrical toy? Right. Yep. I mean, and then, so, so this is, and you can go like Ross Perot complaining about general motors, which had all sorts of innovations that never got out. AT&T invented the answering machine in the 1930s. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily that that uh, I know it didn't get deployed until the 80s. Right. And it, like it's not necessarily that big companies are or aren't innovative, that, but they don't deploy new technology to disrupt their own monopoly or just because they're so bureaucratic. I mean, there's this economist, British economist who um, he has two things going for him. He's got a British accent and he's an economist. Um, <laughs> he, he said the best reward to a monopolist is a quiet life. Right. Yeah. And that's what you have to understand. It's like it is a choice for these companies, whether to deploy technology or not. Um, and if they don't deploy it, they get to keep their monopoly rents. And if they deploy it, maybe they can increase those rents or not. Um, but it's like every other, in, in a competitive market, you're constantly trying to get ahead of your rival. And so you actually don't really have a choice. You have to be continue to innovate. And so that's why I think you've seen, you know, since the dramatic consolidation story started, which I think you could say is probably the 19, late 1970s, uh, early 80s, I think productivity has really, you know, has really come down. And there was a brief moment in the 90s when it, when it went back up, but it's not, um, uh, it's the little guy that brings the new idea in and deploys the new idea. Um, I just want to read you a quote from, from a guy named uh, Praveen uh, Sashadri, who was at Google, he sold his company to Google and he was there for three years while the, the, the um, equity vested. And he wrote a piece about what it was like to work at Google. And he said, um, at the expiration of my three-year mandatory retention period, I have left Google understanding how a once great company has slowly ceased to function. Google has 175,000 plus capable and well-compensated employees who get very little done quarter over quarter, year after year. Like mice, they are trapped in a maze of approvals, launch processes, legal reviews, performance reviews, exec reviews, documents, meetings, bug reports, triage, OKRs, H1 plans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? It, it, that, that, that's the, the fundamental problem here. 
And a company like that is is ultimately going to stumble the way that a Boeing stumbled or the way that we've seen other great companies like General Motors or U.S. Steel or throughout history um, stumble. And that that's very, very dangerous, not necessarily for Wall Street, although it could be dangerous for Wall Street. It's not good to be a Boeing shareholder over the last five years, but it is dangerous. So I yeah, go ahead, Marley. Can we zip back? And fly up like thirty thousand feet. I'm thinking about, you know, the, I mean, just my, my politics are. I'm, I'm I'm a believer in antitrust, and I do believe that we have um, a number of monopolies that should be broken up. Uh, so you know where I stand on things. I'm kind of curious. How do you view? We had the antitrust era in the aughts and the teens, and Standard Oil got busted up into six, seven, eight companies, and then we had the next round where we had like. Um, um, AT and T and Microsoft kind of roughed up by antitrust, and now we have Google under the microscope, where the notion is we're going to take apart the the search versus the ads, and, and the government's after them. How do you put them together in a line? Is is, is it different now than it was prior? Is it the same sort of analysis? Um, has has antitrust changed, or has monopolies changed significantly since you know the good old days? So. I, th I think it's a great question. Um, I, I think we are in a historically unusual position uh, because, you know, you can trace the anti-monopoly. It's not just the antitrust. Antitrust goes back to the 1890s um, to deal with a certain legal uh, form called the trust, which is essentially a big corporation. Uh, but prior to that, there were a bunch of different um, laws to control corporations and monopoly at a state level, at a local level. Um, and you go back to England, the, the, the English Civil War in the 1600s, this tradition, the anti-monopoly tradition or control of corporations is, uh, is really old. And we never saw corporations as purely, uh, purely private until really the 1970s. They were always understood as this thing that the government chartered to allow a bunch of people to get together with some capital and some knowledge and to do something useful and make money at it. Whether it was, okay, you guys want to get together and build a railroad, a dairy processing plant, uh, whatever it is. And, and not be sued personally. I mean, that was the not key Not be thing. sued personally, but also- you know, Liability was the whole idea, you know. Right, but also being able to collaborate, right? Like it's, it's but that's right. And there, there but there were corporate forms that did actually impose liability on shareholders. So that we've had- very like like banks, you know, used to be personally liable as a shareholder of banks in the 19th century. So there are a lot of experimental forms of how we structure corporations. That history has been kind of lost, but um, as we just airbrushed it out and said, oh, America's always been capitalist in the end. That's, you know, and it's like that, that doesn't really tell you much because there's lots of details. Um Antitrust was sort of the one of the ways that we brought that 19th century and 18th century tradition into the 20th century and submerged industrial power into democracy, into forms of self-governance, right? That was always the risk, that these corporations would get bigger than the state or more powerful than the state. Um, what happened in the 80s was the, the implementation of a new way of thinking, which was just that the state should, should back off almost entirely and monopolization, bigness, wasn't something to be feared, but was a symptom of efficiency. It was good, right? And that's why you have a systemic roll-up of power across the economy. And you have whole business models that are built and designed around monopolization because the legal framework changed. And so you look at something like Google, which has... Um, like what, nine products with more than 2 billion users, 15 products with more than 500 million users. It's global. Um, it it has 90% share in online advertising. It's a communications corporation that is bigger than anything we've ever seen. Same thing with Facebook, same thing with Amazon. These are corporations that we've never seen anything like this because we've never had a policy paradigm that allowed anything like this. I mean, the global scope of it as well. Standard Oil controlled everything in the world in 1912. I mean, I, I would say, as a matter of fact, that's probably more d dangerous and damaging than Google is now. Although Google is dangerous now, in my opinion. I don't. I don't. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, 
I, I, you know, like AT and T also had a monopoly on everything. I mean, no, but, but AT and T AT and T didn't. You know, there were there were independent phone companies, but AT and T was also uh, very careful about what they did because they didn't. They understood that they were a regulated utility, right? Um, Google was, and and they, they were regulated at actually at a municipal level. That was something very you know people don't really remember about the phone industry until '96. There was municipal regulations. We are now in a moment. It's because it's not just antitrust. It's also the what what became known as deregulation, where basically the state stepped back and said we're going to allow private firms to engage in forms of price discrimination, which we never allowed before, um, in forms of um, and and in forms of uh, 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 of organizing key social infrastructure, however they thought made sense. So now, can I can I get you to pause for one second there because I just want to make sure people understand a couple of the points that you're raising. Um, first, let's, you know, you're, you're highlighting the competing visions effectively. The Bork Doctrine, which emerged in a book called The Antitrust Paradox, is really the, um, uh, the predecessor or the, the spiritual guide to a lot of the deregulation, right? And what was being highlighted within the antitrust paradox was that effectively antitrust regulation often served to uh, improve competition but not necessarily to the advantage of consumers. It was referred, you know, you had situations where higher cost participants would be preserved because they couldn't be competed out of business. Therefore, the cost curve in the industry was such that consumers might be forced to pay higher prices overall, right? The, the profit margin existed for the lowest cost, most competitive player, but they couldn't go after the entire market, consolidate it and offer lower prices to the consumer. And so this idea of consumer welfare with price being effectively the only mechanism for that being conveyed is what took hold, right? That's, that, 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 that's a time horizon, Mike. I mean, Amazon went out there and destroyed Barnes and Noble. Yep. If they killed them, they went and then opened their own bookstores up. So it depends upon your time horizon for how the consumer is going to do things. I mean, very often you have to go and kill these things in the bathtub before they get out. I, it, Harley, actually, I'm on I'm on your side in this argument, right? So I'm not actually defending this. I'm just highlighting the parameters under which it occurs. I think the second thing, though, that a lot of people really struggle with is like, what is actually a monopoly, right? What does a monopoly mean? And this goes to the points that Matt was making, that the counterfactual is really hard to understand, right? We can talk about, is the world a better place because of the existence of Google, well, Matt, I think correctly brings up, look, they had components of AI several years ago, chose not to release them in the same way we talk about Xerox, not releasing the graphical user, user interface, et cetera, right? Um, or AT&T or Western Union not releasing um, elect, you know, uh, telephones, right? Not assisting in the rapid deployment of those. The actual definition of a monopolist is or a monopoly is a situation under which you are always producing less than you would under competitive conditions, right? So the consumer by definition in a monopoly has an unseen cost in the fact that product is less available than it otherwise would be, right? That, I think that's a really critical component in understanding. Anytime you see these supernatural profits, it's a sign that production is not being pushed effectively to the most competitive out, output, right? And that's true whether it's software, which theoretically, if all software were pushed to its marginal cost of production, we'd have a lot more software deployed. We have people using a lot more stuff. So resisting this, and you can feel this in your own lives, right? Do I subscribe to yet another Microsoft Office update, right? Those were all serious conversations. Do I upgrade to Windows you know, 11? Well, now they've largely taken that away from us and said, you have to pay every single year, right? Through something like Microsoft 365. So all of these are signs effectively of the monopolization dynamic that we're seeing either in the empirical data or being played through. And I just think it's always really important for people to understand that there is always going to be a cost anytime you highlight this. Now, from an investor perspective, it becomes a second question, which is kind of the one that Matt is raising, which is, is it actually even good for the investor to effectively have these conditions in place? And I think there's pretty good evidence, actually. I mean, we certainly saw this with the telecommunications in the 1980s and 1990s, that if you can liberate these resources, you actually can create better conditions overall, right? The problem is, do you actually have the willpower to do that? And can you create the articulation that says, even though an individual investor will lose, 
or individual investors in Google will lose as a society, we're going to do much better. Matt, is there anything that, that, that you disagree with how I characterize that or the, the data underneath it? Well, I think there are, I mean, I, I think that was a really elegant way to put it. I would say just historically, there have always been contesting definitions of what a monopoly is. Um, so, so that the, the way that you describe monopoly is certainly one of them and a, and a core one. And it's one of the ways that underpinned, I think the, um, probably the, you know, night mid 20th century, uh, maybe 1960s onward definition of how like, uh, a sort of antitrust economists would understand monopolization. Um, but there are other, there have been, you could go back hundreds of years. So, but other than that, I, I. I you agree, you, you agree with it. Okay. And so then the, the next thing I would just highlight is when you, if you actually accept that type of definition, there's some really interesting implications, right? If you're underproducing, when are you going to discover that you're really underproducing? And I would highlight that part of what's been so interesting about this cycle that we've gone through has been that it's actually revealed these monopoly conditions in a way that we were probably insulated from in, in a number of ways, right? So when we look at things like PP, you know, PPE production, or when we look at things like um, automobile production, et cetera, ironically, what we've actually found is that when the aggregate demand curve was interrupted and shifted out, we found out just how fragile those supply chains really were and how much that underproduction was likely affecting us. Um, you know, if you look at the work of, um, uh, you know, Robert Hall or others around this idea of when do corporations reveal these types of behaviors is when they can, right? If a high inflationary environment emerges, it becomes very easy for those who are truly protected from competition to say, hey, guess what? Costs are really up. You have to, I have to pass this through to you. And that's really what we've also seen, right? Is that we have seen this dynamic of domestic corporate profits rising very rapidly as a percentage of personal disposable income in other words, more and more of the American dollar that is spent is actually flowing to the bottom line of corporations. And that, you know, it feels to me that this is kind of the critical component that speaks to this, that, you know, speaks to a lot of the, the dynamics. Where we're like, well, why does this matter? You know, and it, it seems to me that we're very much in a position where we've probably gone too far. The pendulum has swung too far in the deregulation framework and certainly too far in the lack of enforcement of antitrust. Harley, do you have thoughts on-, on I, I was gonna ask Mike, um, how do you define a monopoly? Because, and I'll, 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 like, like, the idea is like, I know porn when I see it, I can't define yeah. it. Um, I'm wondering about monopoly because like, I, I happen to have relatives involved in Google and Microsoft um, and, and had nice, nice family, family discussions about this. The pushback against Google being a monopoly, which it clearly is in my view, is that they don't charge anything. How's the, how's the customer hurt when it's free? Now, I would say you're having your personal information stolen from you, um, which is a cost. But nonetheless, there is no actual cost involved and in Google's not raising the prices uh, on people like Microsoft is raising prices for, for their services. H how do you define a monopoly if you can't point to a direct cost to a consumer? Well, I, I think actually, ironically, that's exactly why I defined it in purely economic terms, right? Because the way I would argue is we are being undersupplied relative to what we would otherwise have, right? Simple you're, answer you're to you. are defining it now. The way you've just defined it is mm -hmm. as excess profits, which means you want to go into a 19, what, uh, 70 style profit cap, uh, ex ex excess uh, profits tax on people. That's kind of I'm not suggest. I'm not actually suggesting that at all. I'm actually. You just showed us a chart of uh, profits. I, I I did, but that's actually so. There's a difference between actually saying the solution is then to artificially cap that, versus flipping it around and saying, "Wait a second, this is actually symptomatic of problems that we know exist." And I think that's actually the bigger point. I, the, Matt, what's your reaction to Harley's observation? Are you are you in favor of things like profit caps or? Would you treat it the way I would and simply say, no, this is signs that we probably need to enforce this stuff more? Well, I mean, it's so, so, so one of the things Bork did is it, nope. I'll make a, a slight observation about your characterization of nope. the interest paradox. Bork didn't just say that consumer welfare mattered um, instead of competition. He actually defined competition as consumer welfare. Yes, so what he said true. is, 
if consumer prices, or not just prices, but he said, if output goes up, that's more competition. If output goes down, that's less competition. Or basically like we're gonna guess because in, in a court case, you're guessing about the future. Um, whereas it used to be, you'd say, okay, if there are five companies and that now they're gonna be four because of a merger, that's less competition. And he just said, okay, we need economists to come in and make a guess about whether output will go up or output will go down. And um, that's a different way of understanding what competition really is. So there's a fundamental ideological transformation from concentrations of power to um, uh, uh, to, to efficiency, a view of, of let's just think about efficiency. And I guess my response is when when people when people say, well, Google doesn't charge you anything, it's such a dumb point. I mean, what are they? Do they not make any money? Like clearly they're charging someone for something. <laughs> exactly. Like it's like, don't, don't be, don't, don't treat us like we're stupid. It's like, so it's not, it's not worth any, it's, it's a charity. Like, are you like, what? It's an advertising company. Come on. Yeah. Like, you know, like they have some cloud computing and, but it's an advertising company. So clearly it, they're charging someone. So why don't you look at the advertisers? And that's where you look at the monopoly, right? I mean, it's, it's just so dumb and annoying to have to deal with this juvenile crap. Um, well, I, I, I like, like it's just, I, I, it's no, just no, no, no. Like, I, I love, I love the fiery outburst because it's the sort of thing that I'm known for it, as well. But it, the, it's, um, it's also so circling stupid. back, I mean, circling back. The question is, how do you identify a monopoly? And number two, make this a little more interesting. When is a monopoly good? And I'll, I'll let me, let me just, just dig into this. We have natural monopolies like the water company, the power company. Uh, where it makes sense to have only one person doing this function for society. And, and I would argue that that banks, and I'm, I'm in favor of Dodd-Frank with a few Wall Street guys who actually like it um, or think it was necessary. Uh, I think banks have become a regulated utility. And I think it's a public policy good because we, are, we became a financial economy. They are the plumbing of our economy. Therefore, they should be regulated or be given a, a monopoly uh, profits or, or regulated profits. And, and and you see that when banks are, if the banks get to borrow at the government rate because their passbook accounts are government guaranteed, they shouldn't be allowed to go make excess profits. They should be regulated like the phone company, uh, the, the water company, the power company. So I guess that's a, that's a good monopoly. Where is it? What's a monopoly? And when's it a good monopoly? So this is what I was talking about. The ideological transformation wasn't just about antitrust. It was also about getting rid of, of public utility regulations or or broader a broader view that we need some form of social control of the corporation. And that was a number of things like getting rid of regulations on Wall Street. That was a big part of the idea. Let's let's uh, let's just break down these walls, these these uh, silos across the industry and just have one big pool of money that everybody kind of competes for and will regulate economic activity via interest rate, uh, via the FOMC, which I think is a pretty unstable way to do things. This was part of the ideological transformation that happened. Um, so how do you identify a kind of good monopoly uh, versus a bad monopoly? And what is a monopoly? I mean, the Brandeis and Milton Friedman actually had the same definition of a monopoly, which is a which is control, unified control of a recognized branch of tr a trade or service. So you can define control in many ways. You can define it via price, but you don't have to define it via price. I think you would find that a lot of conservatives feel that um, control over discourse is meaningfully placed in the hands of dominant tech firms, which I think to some degree is accurate. Um, and there are other forms of control that you can you can sort of look at. So I would just say, if you look and you say, someone has substantial amounts of control over an industry, they have market power. They may not have, they may not be a total monopoly, but they have market power. And that that's the way that I, that I would look at it. And then the question is like, what is a good monopoly or where, I mean, I think you'd have to look and say, okay, you know, this, this goes back to the tradition of public utility lawmaking or what used to be called public benefit corporations. Um, uh, you know, go back to the 19th century, there are all sorts of different ways of, of chartering corporations. There are, um, there are certain industries where you have network systems and boom bust cycles, high capital investment, like airlines, shipping, uh, uh, uh railroads, trucking that where, where it, if you don't have some form of price setting, then you will have what's called ruinous competition. We'll have a lot of people enter the market 
um, because it's a high a high fixed cost industry that will uh, lead everybody to undercharge because the marginal cost for that extra ticket is below what the capital cost is. And then you will have the industry go into structural bankruptcy, consolidation, and then there will be an oligopoly that will engage in price setting because that's just the nature of the economics of the industry or the physical characteristics of the industry are like that. That's why, for example, with shipping, it's just such a boom bust industry. It didn't used to be that. I mean, it was always a little, there's always cycles, but like we used to have regulations that prevented that, that allowed for more stable pricing over cycles. So you didn't have a bunch of bankruptcies and then and then under capacity when you when when COVID happens, right? And that's true for airlines, it's true for railroads. And there are a whole bunch of business models that are similar to that or that, that have somewhat public utility type of uh, arrangements like operating systems. And we just never, we never applied any public utility rules to those systems. And we don't really know how to do that now. Um, but you could look at, you know, social media, you could look at search, you could look at a lot of these um, institutions and they look a lot like public utilities. So you can, you can attack them through competition policy, which is, you know, or antitrust and say, we need a bunch of different search engines that that will take care of the problem. Or you can attack them through public utility rulemaking and say, okay, Google, you, you have to disclose certain things. You can't discriminate. Um, there's lots of ways to address these problems. You can do both. Um, I, I would, I would argue we just need a reconceptualization of what it means to, um, to actually have some form of social control over these institutions. Because right now they have control over us and that is very dangerous and it may not look dangerous. And I think your, your point about a higher profit share for corporations is true. And in many ways, monopolies are, at least in the short term, really good for investors. But, um, but it is dangerous long-term. And, and I'll say, it's also not always really good for investors. And I think a really good example of this is that NVIDIA, uh, bought, uh, tried to buy ARM a few years ago. And their their goal there was, okay, we're going to monopolize or we're going to go in, not monopolize, we're going to go in and we're going to, we're going to go in and try to get into the data centers um, and, uh, and compete with Intel and did, and did not may potentially deny other firms access to ARM's um, uh, semiconductor think, designs. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know the the F, the Federal Trade Commission blocked them from from buying that, and a lot a lot of industry dissatisfaction with that as well. Uh, so they weren't able to buy it. And now you look, and it's a few years later, and Nvidia and and ARM have both done fantastically well, right? In in uh, Nvidia, obviously much better. But imagine if Nvidia was spending its time incorporating ARM into its corporate structure instead of really focusing on its its AI chips. That that would have been the cost. And I think you can look at that and say, okay, it's not always good to, that firms have are bigger and, and have kind of more ability to leverage into different areas because they often lose focus. So I just, I wanted to, to, so what to put that What are we supposed to do right now? To, to, well, number yeah, one, so, so, so this is actually, Harley, this is, Harley, let me interrupt. This is a perfect opportunity for us to bring in your poll question which is a question around Google. Can we bring that up, Brian? Okay, so the question is, will the AUS antitrust case, case against Google result in the firm being split into two entities, search and ads? I'm not sure I would have specified how it's gonna be split, but let's just, let's just you know, put it under the category of, is it going to be split? Is the antitrust against Google going to be successful? Let's uh, collect our answers here. Can I, I want to offer a couple of observations about, well, actually, you know what? I can't vote in that poll. You can't, exactly. Can't. That's, I'm a, you can't. I'm, I'm, you're, you're barred. Me. You've stripped me of my right to vote. Yes, yes. You do have we're, representation. We're monopoly. Monsters. Okay, interesting. 76% no. Matt, what's your reaction? Um... Well, I mean, I think the, you know, that's consistent with what we see in the polling and focus group, grouping around the country when we do, when we look at monopolies and we ask people, what do you think? Everyone hates monopolies, right? 90% of the country thinks monopolies, well, however you define it. And the number one way that people define it is the use of the word control. Yeah. Um, 
they think they're bad. So like 80, 90%. And then the 10% of people who, you know, they have no opinion, right? But when you say, well, what should we do about them? People basically say they want the government to break them up uh, or to engage in forms of regulation, but they don't think the government is powerful enough to do that. The government can't do it. So the, the cynicism about our ability to engage in self-governance is really the pervasive view, I think, at large in the in the country. But I don't agree with that. And um, uh, because there's not just one antitrust suit against Google, there are six or seven. Mm -hmm. And one of them was um, a, a case that Epic Games brought about Google's app store, because Google mm -hmm. has a number of different monopolies. And mm -hmm. one of them is, is they have control over Android, um, you know, operating system, the Play Store, right? So if you want to download apps onto any Android phone, you have to go through Google. And that means that Google has market power over anybody that needs to, over the app, the app makers, right? And um, uh, not, a, you know, you can buy a different, you can buy an iPhone if you want, but if, if, if you're an app maker, you have to get to the Android universe. So um, Epic, Epic Games sued and said this is an illegal monopoly, and they also sued Apple. They, they Apple sued. They lost most of the counts. They won one of them, but it was a fairly weak outcome. But, but in the in the in the Google suit, the it was a jury trial, and the jury found for Epic Games. So the jury said Google is an illegal monopolist, right? So now from now on, Google is a an illegal monopolist. That is what a jury found, you know, and it'll get appealed, but. But that's what they found. And a judge could just rule in the next couple of months, we're going to break off Android if he wants to. That He could do that. Uh, and people don't, can't, it's beyond our comprehension, the idea that the rule of law might apply to these powerful entities, but it just happened, right? You have an antitrust suit in uh, DC by the federal government against Google search, uh, search monopoly. That's the deal between Google and Apple. You have an, a, this is the one you mentioned. There's there's a case about Google's um, ad tech, you know, the the plumbing underneath the ad yep. system, and that's going to start. That trial starts in, I believe, October. There's also a Texas version of that that's going to start in 2025, and um, and so there's a there's a series of cases that are, um, you know, there are investigations of Google Maps as well, and these cases are going to play out over the next couple of years. I think it's fairly likely that Google gets uh, gets split up and there really will be, I mean, you know, it's the courts. You never know what they're going to do. But like it, it, it probably would be good for shareholders if Google spun some of these entities off because they would probably do a lot better at this point. You know, YouTube could cut deals with lots of different companies if they weren't part of Google. And um you know, the, the same thing, the ad tech business is probably not doing as well as it could. I, I think what you'll, you could start to see is some pressure from Wall Street for Google to start spinning off parts of their, um, of their firm. And they even, they even anticipated this when they formed Alphabet. The whole formation of Alphabet was about saying, well, we're going to make ourselves easy to split up for the government. So that's, I, I think it's, it's fairly likely. I don't know if it's going to be that particular Break up, but I, I think it's fairly likely that Google will be split up in the next couple of years. Um, I think that's up Siamese so, twin, sorry, chopping up Siamese twins is kind of kind of challenging uh, to do. Is, is the answer really to 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 start, try to prevent? Like, should the government have said, Google, you can't buy DoubleClick and YouTube, Facebook, you can't buy Insta and WhatsApp, Microsoft, you can't buy Skype? If we had said that from the beginning, would that have solved the problem, or a monopoly is the natural course of of, of the economy? Yes, I am fully in favor of, of government enforcers having a time machine and retroactively not allowing those mergers because that would have actually addressed the problem uh, up front. And that is that, you know, it, it is a real tragedy that we didn't stop those, um, that we didn't stop those mergers. And then also another one is in 2012, the Federal Trade Commission did, chose to close their investigation of Google. And one of the reasons is their Bureau of, e of Economics did analysis and said there's no problem here um, because the, the the question was about whether Google was leveraging its desktop monopoly to a mobile search monopoly. And they were, the FTC's Bureau of Economics said, it's a ridiculous premise. No one is ever going to use search engines on their phone. 
Um, <laughs> I mean that, and that that was twenty twelve. It's not like this is this is like five years. The iPhone has been out. Like it, you know. I, I have contempt for economists, and then this is kind of why. Um, so, so but, a couple like, a couple yeah. of quick things, and um, we have a few questions that I think are actually really timely on this, but. The point that I would actually make is I love actually, Matt, that you're taking the other side of the equation and roughly 75 percent of our viewers mimic what we're hearing in the markets. Right. If you go back to the chart that I shared earlier and you assign any of the increase in um, corporate profitability to growth of uh, monopoly or the monopoly like characteristics. And in particular, if we go a step further and say, looking at this increase in profit margins and profit capture by private companies, a, a we know that a larger portion of it is actually coming through to the companies like Google and Microsoft and Apple that are exhibiting monopoly-like characteristics, certainly relative to other areas that are not, right? So the corporate profitability has been much more a function of the largest companies as compared to say the Russell 2000, for example, where we haven't seen the same sort of profit right. shift. And so this is a really critical risk. This is actually exactly why I'm framing it, because what we're talking about here is going back to this whole definition of monopoly. You know, you're talking about the control feature. Well, that control feature really basically allows me to say, I don't need to worry about the competition. I don't need to produce and fully satisfy the market. And so if we break those up and we actually see that we're going to likely see both a fall in profits and an outward shift in production, that in turn leads to falling prices, better outcomes for consumers in aggregate, far more competition and more interesting stuff coming out in a faster way. I think the second thing that I, I really like about that is we got a response um, from one of our listeners saying they voted no, that the U.S. government was going to break up for it based on the performance of this Congress. And I think that's actually a really interesting point that you were raising as well, Matt, that effectively the reason people are anti-action in antitrust is they presume somehow or another that the government then takes over as the entity responsible for the implementation and the subsequent behavior. Ironically, I don't think that has to be the case at all. I think they actually just simply have to say, no, you're not allowed to do this, right? That you, you were forced to break up. Now you guys figure it out, right? You as the private sector figure out how to implement this. Here are the rules. You just can't go around. Does that, does that feel fair, Matt? It does, yeah. Okay, Harley, you were going to say something. Yeah, my, I, I hate to go and, and pick a scab, Mike, uh, but seeing as you're a charter member of uh, of Team Transitory, yeah, the one think, the one that everybody is now acknowledging is correct. But anyway, go except ahead. For the inflation part, yeah. Do you, do you think that this increase in monopoly profits and monopoly control of these you know larger companies is a contributing factor? to inflation and that it might actually be you know something you're missing when you say inflation will be coming back down again. Oh, I don't think there's any question that it's actually contributing to this. This is part of the reason why I highlighted the dynamics around quote unquote greedflation, right? I, I think it's important for people to acknowledge that there is no single component here. We stepped into a situation in which we did something totally unprecedented. We shut the world off we turned it back on and we're surprised that there were significant disruptions. Those disruptions in turn manifested themselves as the ability to raise prices because we've allowed this consolidation to occur, right? And will prices retreat in the way that we might otherwise expect? Probably not if we allow these monopolies to persist. But the flip side of that, Harley, is if you actually believe, Matt, that you're going to break these up, my gosh, there could be an era of competition ahead of us in areas that we didn't expect. So I, I have two more questions here. Um, um, Matt, usually, as always, I will say, and now what? How do I invest to make any money on this thing? But before I get there, I, I, I've always been missed to get involved in politics because there's, there's, there's no winners here. But you know, as you're giving your introductory little commentary there, it occurs to me that, and you say how, how monopolies grow and shrink and collapse and this and that and become bloated and, and self-destructive. I'm thinking about the U.S. as a country, as an entity, and that basically there was a duopoly after World War II, and after 89, we became a monopoly. Is the U.S. as a country actually experiencing this, this path of, of becoming a monopoly and then kind of eating their children? You mean as a geopolitical power? 
has everything. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we're it's seeing point. polarization is kind of eating our sales, or we can't even get a, we can't pass any legislation at all. Isn't this kind of what you just, what you were describing Google as being this giant entity that doesn't do anything anymore? I mean, are, 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 as a country, we become a monopoly where we can't be productive? You know, it's interesting you say we're not passing any legislation at all. The Congress is actually about to pass a, like a big child tax credit um, with some R&D goodies in there. They're good at giving away money. They're, no, they're, but, they're but, like but interesting. no, but it's a meaningful thing, right? A lot of people who are going to get a child tax credit who weren't, who weren't going to get it. Like it, it matters. Um, and I, and I, I, I'm not trying to nitpick because, but, but, because I, I often will bring up things that, that the government is doing and people don't know or don't, and they, and it doesn't really affect the narrative that we can't do anything anymore. And it, so there's something going on and there's something going on where people have lost a sense of, I think elites have lost a sense of confidence in our ability to do anything. And even when you bring up, here's a thing that happened, here's another thing that happened, here's another thing that happened. There's like a, and it's sort of an addiction to powerlessness, which I think is really unusual, I think historically. Um, it, it, you know, is America like a, a monopolist? I mean, uh, that that's, that's, uh, I, I think there's something to that. Yeah, I mean, like John Adams, uh, one of the one of his arguments. I said there have always been contested definitions of monopoly. John Adams was one of the earlier. Um, he was a afraid of monopoly. Um, he's a very uh, confused guy. But he one of the his arguments was the British commercial system was a monopolist and was was a, a, a real risk to the this nascent um, United States. And I think. I think a lot of countries might see the U.S. as um, as a monopolist with with a a, a lot of power. Um, although that's changed a lot because of China, and because of a, a kind of a loss of our own in, internal capacity. Um, I I do think that there is a way in which a lack of competition for influence and uh, um, commercial power allowed us to do things that were maybe not in our best interests. Um, so yeah, I would, I do, I mean, I think some geopolitical challenge, uh, it, like for example, the Russia, Ukraine thing, you can, you can look at that any way that you want, but one of the things that it revealed in the US is that we can't make enough artillery anymore. And we used to be able to make a lot of artillery. We used to be able to make 800,000 shells uh, a month. And now we can make like 30,000 shells a month or something. It's increasing. They're like, we're going to get it up to 70,000. And it's like, that's a 10th of what we used to be able to do in the nineties. Um, so, so there is a sense in which a challenge like competition does actually reveal problems that you didn't necessarily need to deal with before, whether we'll deal with them is a different question, but I think in general competition does force you to become more efficient, get on your toes, um, reconceive how you're doing things. Mike, if this in your wheelhouse, you love talking about the uh, the fall of the Roman Empire, you, one of your favorite books. Yeah, no, I, I, I think unfortunately that this is correct. I think the lack of competition, or at least the perception that there is no immediate need to respond or to make things notably better here than elsewhere, um, contribute to exactly what you're talking about. I don't think the problem actually, so like Matt highlighted the the investment, the uh, uh, tax credit for families, right? And highlighted that's important. I think that's that's really powerful. And Harley, I think you correctly responded to that and said, yeah, we're really good at giving money away, right? Well, a tax credit can be both, right? It allows you to very easily say, we're just not going to take money away from people. By the way, in order to get a tax credit, you have to pay taxes. So it should be recognized that this no, is that's actually, not true, actually this thing actually we mail checks to people okay but let me let me push back on that again all right so so this was a couple of years ago but you know covid happens and within 10 months of genetically mapping a disease that we'd never seen before we had vaccines rolling out of trucks and being distributed to anybody in anywhere who wanted them for for free and that's one of the most extraordinary public health initiatives that we've ever done. So just very quickly, that was, that was a, yeah. I, I, this is one of the challenges though, right? Is because half the population views that as a victory and an understandably- a, a, No, they don't. Using... That, that's what's interesting is nobody sees it as a victory. 
So the left doesn't want to see it as a victory because that was Donald Trump. And the right doesn't want to see it as a victory because they think that the vaccines are, you know, well, that they have they have a their opposed vaccines. And I'm not saying so. So it, it's interesting that they're like, I'm actually. I actually think that when the government does anything useful, people don't notice and they don't want to see it. And that's a strong narrative. And I don't know where it came from. Um, well, you, you know, you know notice. exactly where it came from. Right. I mean, we we have a long history of Ronald Reagan, you know, and the language of I'm from the government is here to help is the scariest words in the English language. I think we see that in the response feature here. And by the way, the government does very little benefit to itself through general measures of incompetence, where it is given the opportunity to make an impact in areas like public education or public health. But the government is us, right? I mean, that's no, the, I, the government Matt, is Matt, trust me, I'm, I am on your side on, in, in this dialogue, right? I think the challenge is, is that we have effectively facts that are being interpreted radically different by the two separate sides. And this is actually, unfortunately, part of the byproduct, I would argue, around narratives being controlled, right? So in a weird way, it's very caustic that you go home and turn on MSNBC or NPR to listen to your news flow, while another half of the U.S. population is doing something like turning on Fox News. And as a result, we effectively don't have a common ground on which to even entertain the facts in which they exist. And so I think that's a really hard part. And the only thing that everyone kind of agrees on is nobody's getting what they want out of it, right? Um, this is actually, I think, you know, Adrian Garcia hit in the questions. We have the question asking about Marianne Mazzucato asking the question of the entrepreneurial state, right? This idea that effectively the state can play a positive role, what used to be known as Colbertism, right, in opposition to Adam Smith. I had a discussion with Jacob Soule, who wrote a book, uh, called The Free Market, The History of a Dream or something like that. I'm blanking on the name of it. That challenges some of the assumptions that the best solutions are those that are arrived at by the market. And the irony, of course, is what you're highlighting, Matt, is there, the market actually responds to the choices that we frame around it. If we choose not to enforce antitrust, the natural byproduct is an emergence of monopolies. If we choose to enforce antitrust, the natural byproduct is going to be an emergence of an increased competition. And that can have bad outcomes for some individuals, and it can actually have very negative outcomes in many situations for consumers who are suddenly forced to say, well, I can't get my Google products for free. But to Harley's point, like maybe you actually start getting paid for your data. Maybe we go, I mean, people forget you used to, if you wanted to do surveys of market behavior, how did you do it? You actually paid volunteers to come in and look at stuff, right? Now those same volunteers are doing it, but they're just doing it for free because we're being provided with the equivalent of donuts and coffee in the form of free access to advertiser sponsored search, right? Um, it, it, I mean, it does feel that that is part of the story that's ultimately going on that we don't we just you know, you know that control feature doesn't well, necessarily me, have to show up as higher prices initially it can show up as we're not going to pay you for showing up for the market research let me offer a slightly different perspective sure, on why on why there's this um collapse in faith right um i think they make a lot of good points and i say that only to pander um <laughs> but uh keep it right into this panel that's perfect okay go ahead um, I actually pin the loss of faith to the financial crisis um, because, you know, what it is, it's a really interesting dynamic where I started, the financial crisis got me to think about monopoly and I was writing about it and I got really into it in like 2012, 13, 14, 15, started writing about it, right? And then in, in like 2018, 2019, I started getting emails from people who are like into crypto and they'd be like, hey, we should work together because crypto is like the same thing as the anti-monopoly. We don't like monopolies and that's why we do this crypto thing because we're going to fight monopolies by building a new system. And it was really, it was pretty interesting and I didn't think much of it. Then a couple of years later, I was like, this is all, uh, you know, this, this looks like a giant scam. Like what's going on here? And these were well-meaning people who, who cared and had strong political views and they were engaged in blockchain stuff because they, that was a political choice. It wasn't like this is, this, it wasn't like email is so much cooler than mail because you can just send it and it goes instantly. It's like, this is a cool thing that's a less efficient spreadsheet, right? Um, it was a pure political technology. It wasn't actually something that 
you could do something with that was better than what you could do with with existing technology. And then I looked into the the bat like the formation of Bitcoin and Bitcoin in the code mentions a headline about the bailouts. Yeah. And and it was what I realized is that there were two radically different views of how people thought about uh, the lessons of the financial crisis. And my view was, okay, there's this corrupt intertwining of of government and banks through a bunch of different institutions, the Federal Reserve, um, you know, Treasury, so on and so forth. And then the the banks, which I think you, you know, Harley, as you noted, it's, it is essentially, it's a public system where we hand out charters. I, I wish we could pay Jamie Dimon as a, you know, as a senior government civil servant, because uh, <laughs> that's what he is. J.P. Morgan's a government bank. Um, but, uh, but you, you, um, you know, one of the my lesson is when we pull away all of those rules that are important for for fostering a, a democratic system, and you build a government that's designed around consolidation, that's what you get, and that's bad. And we should build a different governing system because if you incentivize corruption, you get corruption and oligarchy. The Bitcoin and then the blockchain types were like, okay. It's all corrupt. Government is inherently corrupt. So what we need to do is get away from having government and actually just not even have, not even try to come together and build a society. We are all free floating individuals who should be off the grid if we choose. And that's a very different ideological choice. I don't think that is actually a sustainable choice. Um, I think as we saw, it was like a, a, it was a giant scam, but like it was ideological view that I think is very strong in our society now that there is no such thing as a collective uh, shared interest and there is no way to collaborate uh, to actually help each other, at least through politics. You can do it through volunteerism, but not through the art of politics, which is the art of building a society. And that I think we saw with uh, President Obama was so inspiring in 2008 to so many people and then was so fundamentally um, aristocratic in the ends that he pursued and so harmful to so many people that there was this tremendous loss of faith that democracy even could work. And that's where we are. Um, and I think I agree with a lot of what you said about polarization. That's a real phenomenon. But the the if, if I, I saw up close how unwilling the Obama administration was to govern and I saw the democratic establishment argue that governing was not the point of politics to protect Obama and to protect what they were doing. And you tell that lesson enough times. I don't think you need to tell the Republicans that governing is bad. They already believe that. They believe that since the 80s. Obama told that to Democrats. And so you have this now uh, basically a bipartisan consensus that governing isn't something that the government should try to do. It's changed a little bit because there's been a sort of a quasi rejection of Reagan, a quasi rejection of Obama, but it is still there and it's very strong. So I, I think that's a great place to wrap up. And now Brian has shown up and he's basically saying, all right, come on, Mike, wrap this up, baby. Um, look, I, I think what you're highlighting, Matt, and I think in particular your last comments, that there is some break in the hagiography of Reagan now. There is some break in the hagiography of Obama. And that does feel to me to actually be the first signs that this dialogue is changing. I think, you know, again, the statistics that we got on the breakup of Google, the reaction that we're seeing within the conversations on chat or Q&A are largely about this dynamic of we just don't trust the government. And to your, you know, I think what you're highlighting is that we're starting, I think we're just now starting to see people realize that that's actually an unacceptable outcome, right? That we do need to figure out some way to come together so that as a social species, we can actually start working in a positive direction. I think the irony that I would highlight is, is that a lot of that is actually going to involve some surprises to the investor class. One of those probably being a far higher probability than 25% that something like Google gets broken up. And that starts the process of retreat of the extraordinary profitability that we've seen in many corporations. So I, I, I see you nodding in response to that. I think this is going to be one of the really interesting questions. And then the last thing I would just say is like, why do we care about this? You know, again, to share one last slide, um, 
you know, the, the simple reality is that competition doesn't work unless you actually do um, have markets that are broken up where individual opinions can matter. And so this is my, you know, uh, you know, personal crusade. We need to recognize that our theories of how markets work actually require somewhat similarly sized players. When you have giants trampling around, the reality is, is that the small investor, the small fund manager, really is actually just trying to stay alive in a very rough sea as compared to think strategically about what the world looks like going forward. So with that, I'll stop my diatribe. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Harley, it was awesome to have you here. You only use Team Trans once. It's a clear sign that victory is upon us. Um, and I'll let Brian take it home from here. Yeah, so people who had the uh, the over on Harley's comments on teams, Team Trends, uh, apologies for that. But if you want to learn more about Matt, check out uh, mattstoller.com. You can follow Matt on Twitter or X, as they call it. And obviously, they're doing their best to make sure they're not a monopoly. So he's at Matt Stoller. And then next month, at Matthew Stoller, industry at Matthew legend. Stoller. Yeah, just yeah, Matthew Stoller. I've screwed that up a couple of times. There's a there's some guy who has Matt Stoller and I feel bad for him. <laughs> okay. so Matthew Stoller, sorry, at Matthew Stoller on uh, Twitter X. Uh, and then next month on the 14th of March, we're welcoming industry legend Jim Grant of uh, Grant's Interest Rate Observer, of course, who joins us to discuss soft landing, the Fed pivot and other stories you might have been tempted to believe. So thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time.